Good evening. My name is Mark Loveland. I'm a trustee with the Houston Ballet and a member of our ambassador committee. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's dance talk, wherein we'll discuss character roles and how those character dance and how those fit into the upcoming performances of Coppelia and The Merry Widow. We also have a special treat because we have students from our professional program who will actually put the words that you'll hear into action, uh, which will be a very learning experience for all of us. Uh, the Dance Talk series has been very popular. It's uh, very special to me. and I know a lot of other people I've spoken with. It uh, gives us an opportunity to f see the, the, the designers, the dancers, the choreographers at their work where they share that magic that they put together that allows us to enjoy the performance as an audience. Um, if you enjoy the Dance Talk series and would like to learn more about them, after the uh, performance, Nancy Little, myself, and some of the other staff members will be in the lobby to uh, answer any of your questions. We have a table with a lot of handouts that will uh, enable you to see coming events as well as performances and membership. So we're there to answer any questions you might have and to uh, uh, guide you in any way you might want to become more involved with the Houston Ballet. The uh, program now will be turned over to our Director of Education and Community Engagement, Jennifer Summers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Well, so first of all, thank you so much for braving the elements. This is a, a room full of ballet lovers and brave Houstonian drivers, so thank you. Uh, before we get started, go ahead and turn off any things that buzz. Um, we will, um, the, the ushers are there to help you out if should you need to leave in the middle of the, of the program. Because we have performers tonight, if we can just ask you not to use the door you came in, which is a slightly strange request, but it works for this space. Um, I am, this is, I have to say, we've got some special guests in the audience tonight. We've been doing, this is the third in a four-part course that uh, Houston Ballet has been doing with the Women's Institute all around Coppelia. Uh, so I'd like to welcome them here tonight in addition to all of you. Um, and I want to tell you, this, this, this particular dance talk program is a couple years in the making. I, wanted, I approached these three wonderful people, gosh, two years ago about doing this in conjunction with Swan Lake, but alas, Harvey. Um, so we're finally getting to do it, and I, I am so honored to share the stage with Stephen Woodgate, who not only is Houston Ballet's ballet master and has been for 15 years, but he is also the Merry Widow guru. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. He's the person who sets it on anybody who wants to do it. So we are hearing from the very best tonight. And then to his left is uh, principal instructor Shireen Bush, also middle and upper school principal of the academy. Um, and I have the privilege of watching Shireen uh, cure, take care of this precious art form that we all love and also even more importantly, deliver it with love to the next generation of dancers. Um, she and Beth Everett to her left, who's the lower school principal, are responsible for curriculum, all kinds of curriculum throughout the academy. Um, and they do so with excellence every single day. Um, but what, what we don't always see as, what you don't always see if you're not behind the scenes is the love with which they do that for all of our academy students. So the fact that we got them to be out on stage with us today was a feat, <laughs> but also a great, great honor. So please welcome them. So when we, we're talking about character dance, and I think it's really important. Beth asked, actually asked me a question uh, before we started. Are we talking about character roles? We use this word character in ballet quite a bit. Uh, tonight's focus is on the tradition of character dance in classical ballet. Um, so you're not necessarily playing a character. You are representing a, a folk dance 
from usually an Eastern European culture. And actually, those folk dances, not just ballet interpretations of them. They're really legitimate um, dance forms. And we thought, Steve and I were gonna talk a little bit about the origin of character dance in classical ballet. And to do that, we really need to start with Marius Petipa. Um, you know him as the original choreographer of uh, Nutcracker, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, a collaborator with Tchaikovsky, and many, many, many more ballets that you're familiar with on the Houston Ballet stage. He's a French man, French dancer, French trained dancer who became the ballet, ma ballet master of the Imperial Ballet in St. Petersburg in 1869. And the ballets that he did are, again, the ones that you're familiar with. The tradition there really moved into choreographing these great big long ballets that had very simple stories. The first one that comes to mind, obviously, is Sleeping Beauty. We can tell you that story in 90 seconds, but when you see the ballet, it's a prologue in three acts. <laughs> so what he did was fill this fairly simple story with these things called divertisements. And really what divertisements are, they can be a solo, they can be a duet, they can be a trio, they can be an octet, they can be done. Um, in, in Sleeping Beauty, I always think of, uh, in the prologue, what, is it seven or eight fairy variations? It, Seven, but there's the, the um, lilac fairy too, so I suppose there's eight. Yeah, so, and they're all divertisements. They're not telling a story so much as setting the scene for us. And so th this became really how you put a ballet together. And so many, many divertisements that you see are traditional ballet. But then he also reached into the folk dance world to pull these traditional folk dances uh, into and, and created divertisements out of them as well. And they equally, they, they, they're, they're absolutely fun to dance. They're, they're, they're fun to watch. They tend to be mostly high paced. And they also help us set the scene for where, wherever we are. Um, so I thought I would look at um, other ballets. This is some Swan Lake photos. And maybe you can see, Stephen, what exactly we're looking at here. So this is the Spanish dance from, uh, well, this one's the Spanish dance. And this one's the Russian uh, the Russian dance from Swan Lake. But I have to say, he yes. also, uh, he was in, Petipa was in Spain, where he got the idea from Don Quixote, apart from the book, because he saw he, he was getting away from some girlfriend problems that he was having in his country, apparently. I heard this a long time ago. And he was in Spain, like in a cafe or something, and they were doing flamenco dancing. And so they have all this wonderful hand gestures and all of that kind of stuff. And so that's, how Don Q came about. The, I mean, it's, a, it's not exactly a flamenco dance in the third act, but there's an idea of a flamenco dance. It's a, it's a, it's a ballet that had a, a flair of the particular country that it came from. So, for instance, that one came from there. Mm -hmm. But then there are also people like um, Bournonville who did um, the, his idea... Actually, it was Taglioni first, his father, her fa father first, that did a version of La Sulfide. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, uh, where is it? Uh, Scotland was yeah. the most far away, amazing place that people from the uh, top part of Europe had never heard of or never been to. It sounded like the most bizarre place. So let's set a ballet in Scotland. And wear kilts. And wear kilts so that they did a Scottish dance for all the things. So that's another thing. And that's pretty authentic Scottish dance, um, except that there's uh, sylphs in the other, you know, the ethereal things that are in the, you know, in the other act. So not only him, but also uh, the version of La Filmagada that we have is Ashton's version, that's the most popular one. But one of the ones that was also done was Petipa's version, which also had a kind of French dancing uh, in it as well, and, Petit and uh, Ashton decided to use English Morris dancing for his, you know, it's called a stick, we call it the stick dance, but it's actually, it's from Morris dancing. Uh -huh. So there's uh, a lot of people use these ethnic kind of feelings for their their ballet or a story like Bayadere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's set in India, so it has an idea of Indian temple dancing. So then let, th let's explore that because I think we, we think about Nutcracker maybe as the one where we, we know that and we go to the second act, we're getting divertisements that are inspired by countries from around the world. So would you consider those character dances or ballets, ba uh, ballet inspired by countries? In Nutcracker, I actually think it's ballets inspired by countries because it's not an actual flamenco dance for the Spanish. It's not an actual Cossack dance, although it's pretty close to a Cossack dance, but not actually. Um, 
so, and then a Danish dance, and this, I think they're, they're ideas of what, you know, sometimes it's just an idea of a, a head or a, an, that kind of thing that makes it, the style slightly different. A flavour. Next toe or something a little bit different, not an actual dance, but then there are actual dances in other ballets, like, for instance, Campaglia, and which we're doing, and... And in a small way, Mary Widow as well has, you know, character dances that are from an eastern country. Or so a char- what, what characterizes, I didn't mean to use that word, but what characterizes a folk dance is that it's, it, it's technically... It's authentic. It's authentic. Yeah, I, Rather I, I than just an inspiration. Rather than a ballet idea of what a Spanish dance is, which is also lovely, but it's, it's, uh, it maybe it doesn't have the absolute technique of it. You know, it's turned out. Ballet dancing is all about turning out and using the feet in a certain way, and in a point shoe, of course in those 19th century ballets. So, um, you know, obviously real authentic character dancing from Poland wouldn't be in a point shoe, of course. So, um, so I have another image from Sleeping Beauty, which we, we do, in fact, even though it takes place in a court, we get to see a mazurka in, within Sleeping Beauty as well. Um, yeah? I think it's a polonaise. Is it a polonaise? Yeah. Well, see, this is why I <laughs> Well, there is a mazurka in the end. No, sorry, there is a mazurka at the end in the final. Yes, there okay. is. You're right. All right. Phew, yeah. <laughs> Got my facts right. Um, so, but I think that what it, the reason I think it makes a lot of sense to do this dance talk around Coppelia and then also a little bit Mary Widow is that a lot of us, this, our, our introduction to performing um, character dance or learning character dance may very well have been in it Act was, One of Coppelia. It was for me. Mm-hmm. No, I was thirteen, and it yeah. was, was for me too. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start. Let's go there. Let's go to Coppelia. Let's set the scene. Um, we are. What? What? One of the things that makes Coppelia a little bit different than the other two ballets that that I mentioned so far, which is Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty, is the fact that we are dealing with peasants and we are in a village and not a ballroom. Um, and so, how are the character dances used in Act One? Would you say? And what are we seeing? Well, it actually, they they give the flavour of the village. So, for instance, Capella is set in a Polish village, so which is why there's a kind of a Polonaise type feel to it. But we were just talking about it. Even though it's set in Poland, there's a Hungarian Shardash in it. And, and isn't there a German Burgemeister too? There is. Uh-huh. There is yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit mixed up, but. Uh, it's really to set that. Also, there wasn't um, when Capelli was first done, which was I can't remember the year, but it's very early on. There weren't a lot of top ballet dancers around. For instance, the star of the show was a girl, and she was only 16 years old, Swan Hilda, and her partner was a woman dressed up as a man because they often used to do that in those days. So, you know, they were. It was mainly probably women and it was, you know... So character dances, you don't actually have to have almost the best classical technique to do those type of things because they're, they're you know, they've got energy and they've got a verve and they've got their own special style. And anyway, for Capella, I find that it's... Well, it's, it's, en- it's enjoyable to watch. They're great, exciting dancers. And in this, in Ben Stevenson's version particularly, they do help to tell the story because they happen from an argument. So he's just had an argument with Swan Hilda, and let's go and pick the other girl and let's get into this dance. So it so has a Stevens referring to Franz, who is the love int- the, the, he's the lead male and he's the love interest of the village girl named Swan Hilda. That's right. And so the character dances sometimes start because of a, a little argument. And okay, let's get all together and let's go and do this dance. And and they basically they set they set the flavour of the of the piece. He's dancing with another girl. All the men start to dance together. All the ladies dance together, and show their, you know, and show their um, style and their and personality. their happy village life. And their happy village life, or their unhappy village yes, life. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> so we see it, the first character dance we see is a mazurka, which, as Stephen yes. indicated, comes from Poland. Mm. And then what happens after that? Oh, then lots of little things happen, little story bits happen. Yeah. And then we go into, actually, uh, Capella is interesting because it, it's a set in a village that has uh, lots of um, superstitions. And so Dr Capella, they feel, is an odd bod because he never comes out of his house. And so they think he's a, either a drunk or he's a devil. It's a very religious city. There's also a church in the background, so things that very much to do with church life as well. And... Uh, they also have these uh, quite pagan things where they think they have the, um, the wheat and if you can hear the wheat rattle in the, in the, in the sheath thing, 
they uh, are going to have a happy marriage. And of course, she doesn't hear it. And so she's all very upset. So that's another kind of thing of this village, which then goes into a shardash after right. that. So, <laughs> so you get in an argument and you do a mazurka. And if yes. you feel it's going to be unrequited love, you do a shardash. And we go into a shardash. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in Ben's version, it's the same dancers that do both, the mazurka and shardash? Okay. Yes, it's the, the village people. The village do people. It, yeah. And I have over here, it's actually not a mazurka costume, it's a, one of the Friends costumes, but it gives you the sense of um, the, the style that Desmond Healy created for the villagers, which has quite a bit of paint in the decoration, mm. which is different um, for, for ballet costumes. And then if you see on the table, that you, they're, those dancers, the mazurka and shardash dancers, they don't, as Stephen was alluding to, they don't wear point shoes. They wear character shoes, and in fact, um, those character boots are actually ordered straight from the Ukraine, which is where a lot of those dances still are, um, are, are, there are companies dedicated to the traditional Eastern European folk and dances. And the, the men were using those shoes today, and they're actually, we're not used to, not me anymore, but the dancers aren't used to wearing heels. And so to do dancing in heels and to lift girls in heels is actually quite strange. So they were having a little bit of problems today with that. And the reason they have the heels is? It gives the style and the, you know, the- Percussive. Yeah. Say that again. It's percussive, mm -hmm. and so you can yeah, hear, the, hear the rhythm. Yeah, great. All right, so let's go, go, before we see the dancing, let's go on to Mary Widow. Um, this, uh, this, you, you tell a great story about the fact that, uh, or you told me that it's not an actual, oh, yeah. we're not in an actual play. No, it's Do you want to elaborate place. on that? <laughs> it's called Pontevedria, which doesn't exist, but it's uh, some Baltic state company, country, and um, basically it's about uh, the whole country is completely out of money and that they're in, um, the embassy in Paris is desperate to get money and they've heard that a very rich widow from Pontevedria is coming to town and she has 20 million francs and if she marries a foreigner like a Frenchman, they'll lose all the money, so it's their, opportunity for them to for her to marry into the country so that all the money will stay in Pontevedria. So how does character dance show up in Mary Widow? Well, to put uh, the first thing is a ballroom dance. So that's not a character dance. That's because it's in France. The next the next act uh, takes place in her country villa outside of Paris and it's like Pontevedria day, like July 4th or Australia Day or something. So you have a big celebration and you do your national dances. You wear the national costume, which is one of those is that one. Yeah. And you wear the national costume and you do the national dances. Now, because it's a made up country, there is a mixture of Ukrainian and it's a bit of a Polonaise, a bit of a mazurka and a bit of Georgian dancing all mixed in to one to make the country. Make Pontevedra yes. traditional. Yes, so the men do all this sort of like, uh, what, what do you call it? Um, like the nutcracker thing, what did we talk about? The, um, the Cossack, bit of, has a bit of Cossack stuff in it. And then the girls do all this, this kind of thing, which is the Georgian, Georgian. dancing mm -hmm. where, where you don't see the girls. It looks like they, they're, they're just moving this across the floor. So there has a little bit of that in it. And uh, it's signature step, which will I show you the signature step? Yes. This definitely. is the signature step. I've got to do over here. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, this, is the Missouri, this is the Polonaise. Okay, so it has a bit of that. One, two, three, one, two, and one, two, three, three. That's the signature entrance step that they do. So it's a mixture of, of everything. So in Pontevedria, your signature step is a mix of Polonaise and Mazurka. Yes, right. it has no significant country. <laughs> yeah. So this is, I'm probably getting my head of myself by asking this, but is that difficult to teach the dancers because yes. it's not something they've been trained to do? Yes, and I always have to say it's more, there's more back, so I just didn't do it very well then actually. There should be a, a lot of back, so there's all of that, in, and dancers don't like to do that because it's not comfortable. Yeah. And also they're in shoes like that yeah. too, so, yeah. <laughs> So we can't, I mean, we, we assume that our 60 dancers at Houston Ballet are all, we, we know that they're trained well in classical ballet and have been doing so for a long time. Let's shift the conversation to how we begin to train students, why and how we begin to train them um, as, uh, as character dancers, or that they have that skill when they get 
to a company that's doing Coppelia and Mary Widow back to back. Um, what, what, obviously it's important to learn the steps so that you have to do the ballets, but Beth and Shireen, what do you think, and Stephen, the importance of learning character dance, what does it contribute to you as a ballet dancer? Well, I think, you know, when you're working in a character dance class, you coming in as the ballet trained student at whatever age you are taking class, you have your basic um, technique. What you're trying to do with character dance is add more flavor to the movement. There's a lot of use of a ma use of the upper body, as Stephen said, doing movements that you're not comfortable doing, teaching a rhythm that is not necessarily just working with the beat of the music, but working with the rhythm and the syncopation. So you have one leg making one movement and the second leg is getting a double beat and you're angling the body at whichever way and direction you have to go. So you start off at the bar and you teach simple combinations and you build on the musicality and the style. Um, and I always find with kids, they find it um, a huge challenge to do and so much fun. Um, and it really is just, it's, it's an awareness of music. It's a, an awareness of rhythm. It's an awareness of style. It's an awareness of flavor. You cannot be a character to dance. And I always say to the, the students in class, if you beige, you have mm -hmm. to really color your movement. Um, and some of them really have to get in, more internalized and think about how they feel and how they project movement that they're making. So character dance for me is a hugely important in the dance training um, of a student. Yeah. You want to add? To I was going to say about the beige, that's so perfect what you said there because it's true you can't be a, a performer of any sort being beige. It, it has to be, it has to be, a, and I remember, I mean I took character classes for three years and that was all, I, sometimes I must say teenagers don't want to do it, they're all kind of, well, let's just get over and done with and just, just do the class. Mm -hmm. But you can't be like, you can't be a performer like that and it, it so helps for rhythm, like she was saying, for rhythm and for performance quality. When you see all those amazing people, Russian dancers who have, they don't mind, just do full out, every motion is, is perfectly uh, rounded. That's because of the character stuff, actually. Yeah. It really helps, but the rhythm thing is perfect. You're making me think that you're, it helps create a three-dimensional dancer. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dynamic, and it makes them dance out of their comfort zone. Somebody once said to me, and I've never forgotten this, that when you think of ballet dance, you think of pictures. You're working for a line, you're working for a shape, you're working to sustain that picture. Character dance, you're thinking about the whole film mm -hmm. because it keeps moving, it moves as a group, mostly. It has to move together, and it keeps your interest. So we have to be those performers to draw in the audience to keep them interested. And you are correct, when they're older, the students seem to think character dance is not important. When they're younger, they love to rise to the challenge. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. They love to, um, they, to learn about the different styles, to learn about the music. Um, when, they're, when they're young, that's kind of our opportunity to teach them about um, a tarantella, about um, a Spanish waltz, and, and kind of give them the opportunity to learn about the music that they're dancing to. And um, I always try to liken, everybody said flavor. I, I think each of you have said flavor about four times because it's really true. And I always try to tell them it's like food, you know? You can have a potato and you can make it a hundred different ways and it makes it taste different and it makes you. Um, know where you're from and or know where you are um, and I think that they really start to get excited about that um, I was asked like what their grandma you know what her favorite dish is and and it's that uh, pride in they have to imagine that they're from these countries and they have to imagine that they have this national pride because like in Poland there are five national, I think five national character dances, folk dances, just in Poland. And when those, the people perform them, they perform them with a different feeling inside that projects out. And it's not it, just the dance technique, it's representing. Right, it's folk. not just the form, it's, it's like deeper than that, yeah. And so it helps them kind of um, connect to the movement in a different way. So t talk a little bit about how character, the character program is integrated into the Houston Ballet Academy. 
So from, from the young, not too young, um, but we find that from the maybe a level one, level mm -hmm. two, you start just um, implementing the idea of little heel close, heel close, three little claps or something, so they understand the rhythm and the musicality that you're going for. Polka is a simple step that, you know, we all think is so easy, but for a younger child, to polka, to polka turning, to polka turning with a partner, is a huge challenge. As we go through um, the levels, we have a, a classical technique, but we have a character bar, and as Stephen said earlier, it's, it's so much fun to do a character bar, mm -hmm. and some of which you will see um, this evening with our pre-professional students who really wanted to do it, and we wanted to put them out there and let you see them. Um, so working on that, on, you know, working on that style, how that really, I've, I can honestly say, they lose some of their inhibitions as dancers. They tap into where the movement comes from in feeling it more than just doing it, and it's hugely supported by the accompaniment um, of the music that they have because you really get to understand the quality and that quality translates through all of their dancing. So. Um, when I was uh, still a dancer, uh, I went to Russia in 89 to do this ballet competition and one of the things that I got to see was the Bolshoi, he was like, mm. <laughs> and I saw the Musayev <laughs> Dance Company. They were the best thing I saw in the whole three weeks or something I was there. They were incredible. That was dancing. And if I hadn't been a ballet dancer, that's what I'd wanted to do. It was so exciting, rhythmical, the music's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it, it showed different dancers from different countries, but at, you know, at the top level. And even, even the ice skating I saw, which is interesting, had, had kind of a, they just saw ice skating as well. They also did a little bit of this character type dancing, which was also wonderful. And again, it's connected to where they're from and who they are, yeah. not just, and what you, were, what you were saying, Shireen, made me think about the fact that losing the inhibition, letting go of the perfectionism that we strive for oftentimes in They look like ballet. they love it too. Like it looks, in, you, they enjoy it and you enjoy it because it just looks so much fun. Right. And if their basic technique is there, they're going to move like a dancer. They just have to, again, as we say, flavour the movement more. And tagging on to what you said about Moseyev, we are so really fortunate to bring in Tom Bosmar into Houston Ballet to work with our students. Um, he should have been here this evening, but mm -hmm. his plane was delayed. Oh. Um, and he's going to be here for a good few weeks. And he was a dancer yes. with Moseyev. And it's, it's unbelievable. When he um, conducts a class, he has everybody just totally riveted to <laughs> his teaching. And that's, I mean, he was a professional dancer, but in oh, a yeah. character dance company. Yes, absolutely. Great. Yep. All right. So what we're going to see tonight um, is, do you want to talk a little bit about the kids? And then um, we, we all get some help clearing the stage so we can see a little bit of what a character uh, class and the character dances look like. Do you want to uh, introduce right. the kids? Right. So for this evening, we have nine of our pre-professional students who will be um, demonstrating some character bar work. We took the plies and we put it in centre so it's a little more interesting to the audience. And then we go through the steps in a character class, so usually the ballet steps, just again, you'll see, with uh, if you are familiar with the ballet class, you will see that it seems like more exaggerated a pour ma, a lot more movement in the footwork, a lot more active at the bar than just on one supporting leg with one working leg. So they're going to do um, a couple of, no, more than a couple, a few exercises at bar and then take a break and then some of Beth's little ones are going to come center and show you a... They'll show you a mazurka and then a little Hungarian dance um, that they're pretty excited about. <laughs> and then the, the older students, again, are going to return and in center they're going to show you um, more of a mazurka, so we're going to build on what Beth is showing you. They're going to show you a shardish. Um, they're going to show you a um, really fun Hungarian combination. And we're going to see them in their um, class clothing, which in character class is character shoes and character skirts. So the use of, if you look at both of the Mary Widow costume and the Coppelia costume, there's, there's an opportunity not just to wear the costume, but to use it as part of the dancing, which I'm assuming we'll see as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so give us a couple minutes to clear the stage, and we'll, we're going to invite um, 
the pre-professional dancers, upper school dancers, yes? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes. Dancers, come on out and take your places at the bar. And we're ready to go.
as they're clearing the bars, just some uh, observation. We really did see a classical ballet bar in the sense that we had a plie, a tendu, a rond de jambe, a grand batma, but, and then we'll talk about that part in a second, okay. but what, but noticeable differences. So what are, what can you point out for people who might not be as familiar with a ballet bar, significant differences sort of in the structure of those combinations and what you add in in a character class? Um, I, well, I think you want to make it, um, instead of the clean cl um, classical lines, you're having much broader lines, a lot more use of a mar. You don't work with a quarter turn of the head in character, you work with half a turn of the head. You work with a more exaggerated use of the upper body, um, either back or forward. You work a lot on a, a diagonal. And again, you could see that you wouldn't just do a tendu close and a weight, you would use a tendu close and use the in-between counts with the footwork or the grand batma. You do grand batma, which was a Spanish waltz, going one, two, three, two, two, three, three, and down. So you're accenting different counts, making them more aware of the quality and the style of the movement. And that's really interesting because I think we can sometimes get struck, stuck if it's a waltz with three beats in a measure, mm -hmm. emphasizing as regular people, emphasizing that downbeat on one, but in fact we're gonna see all, all of the um, parts of that measure emphasized tonight as well as the spaces in between. Right. And the last, the fifth combination, can you talk a little bit about what, how, how, what kind of correlation you would make between that and a ballet? Exercise and a ballet exercise. Well, it really isn't something that you could compare to a ballet exercise. But once again, they, I think with an exercise like that, the challenge um, for them and that I'm putting on them in doing it is the different movement the legs and feet are making in different directions at different rhythms, keeping the musicality, keeping the the heel toe beat or a flick flack, which is a standard step that they would use in a ballet class, but putting a different spin onto that flick flack putting it in a folk type uh, rhythm, mm -hmm. so it makes it a lot more exciting, keeping the um, technique of a ballet dancer so the energy is on the up. Um, they love it, they love that exercise. And the directional changes are really yes. fun too, yes. and a challenge. Yes. Okay, great. Beth, can you reintroduce what we're about to see? So the first one is a mazurka, um, and this is more just, uh, you can use this rhythm for lots of different steps, but this one is more for port -bra. Um, and then the next is a little Hungarian step um, that has to be done with lots of flavor and energy and paprika, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, what level are these kids? Um, intermediate and level five. Thank you.
Very nice. Would you like to introduce the last piece? Or last pieces? The last few pieces. So I think the first one, I'm not sure of the order anymore. I think the first one is a shardish. Yes, girls? Yeah. And it's a slow shardish combination, um, more controlled. Following after that, we would have a mazurka and then a nice, really lively Hungarian combination. Um, I think one thing about character when they're dancing in groups, um, it encourages students to be aware of one another and to dance together because most often they're doing the same movement and in order to be musically correct and obviously for patterns to work, they have to work together. So working together as a group now is where we start. <laughs>
So a question, or an, I guess an observation, really, that everything that they did at the bar work, you could as particularly, I think, really see come back in their group dances. So that's a similarity to ballet, where we're, we're using the bar to give us preparation for the, the more complicated center work. And Stephen, I wondered if you, as we bring our chairs back out so that we can hear from you all, um, the, just a, it's true that the Shardash that we'll see in Coppelia has that same idea that we, that w what we saw here, where it starts slow and gets faster, yeah. Is that right? Yes, pretty yeah, much so, yeah. although the mazurka actually starts pretty much straight away. Right. Dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba. Yeah. That actually starts pretty fast <laughs> to start with. Yeah. It's the shardash that, the shardash, that has a, right. a stronger, uh, more uh, earthy type feel to mm -hmm. it, which is a little mm -hmm. bit slower. So much slower. All right. That actually brought back memories of doing character class on the bar. Were they yes. good ones? <laughs> yes, good ones. Yes. <laughs> good memories. That's good. All right. So um, thank you, first of all. Let's give another round of applause to all the dancers. A lot of times they get to look out and see uh, you know, a dark audience where you're, you, you, it's a little less personal than what we, they, they were out here seeing all of your faces today. So that took a lot of courage and we're grateful for that demonstration. Um, I, would, I wanna ask if, if there's anything else you guys wanna add to or comment on about what we just saw before we open it up to question and answer. Any other little, no? Okay, great. Well, so it's time for you to ask questions. And I will say one thing. Yeah. Sometimes um, the males, w when we do character class, is a little bit different. Yes. The centre work yes. is always a little bit different. Yes. I remember having a lot of things where we're holding hands and uh, you know tops of shoulders and things and doing group work that way, mm -hmm. which actually Mary Widow has a little bit of the men connected. Yes, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. like, like Greek dancing in a way. Yeah. So, so character classes are they single sex or combined? Combined. Combined. They're yeah. combined, and yeah. um, with the boys or the males, you would have um, a lot of the um, Hungarian, Russian, I definitely cannot do it, mm. when you know they kind of go into a grand plié and then the legs would go out or the split jumps, yes. or they, yeah. they're bigger movements and they're a lot on really bended knees or on their, what do you call them, like your haunches, I don't know what you call it, yeah. I mean, sometimes they're even on their knees yes. doing things. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And we will see quite that. Different, so. yeah. Is that in the scene where they're at Hannah's villa? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. So something to look for. <coughs> and All they right. don't they don't wear boots in our um, classes here because they're really expensive. Um, but they do wear boots when we do performance. Um, and we had a fantastic character piece with all the boys in boots and great energy and very challenging. But mm. at the summer school you always yeah. do really yes. good yes. things. Yes. Great rhythm and all of that. Great rhythm and all of that in, in the piece that the boys do, and they have boots where they actually utilize the boots for, for sound as but well. Not just hand uh, claps and stomps, but right. actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you have that. <laughs> I'm not a boy, but I got the boots. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd love to open it up for questions. We've got some of those dancers in the back. Um, questions from you. Please remember that in this room, we li I like to be able to repeat the question to be sure everybody has heard it. Yes. So the question is, do all full-length story ballets have character dances? I think most of the 19th century ones do. Yeah. The ones that, you know, all the Tchaikovsky ones from the 1890s, they all do, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and the ones before that, I mean, Giselle doesn't really have a character dance, but Sylphie does and... But uh, even the villager the dances... does, of course. And, yeah. Even the villager dances in Giselle have... The, yeah, they, sort they of. aren't character dances, but yeah. it's that earthy feeling as opposed to the ethereal yes, willies. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and even um, if you saw Sylvia, there were Greek influences, Greek dances. Stanton um, did that on purpose. Yeah, Greek so even newer that. story ballets are being interjected with. He made us actually look at some Greek dancing to have a look at, there's a little bit in the finale where the guys come on joining hands and to have a look at it and see what kind of style that was so that we get an idea of the concept of what he wanted to do. And again, for the same purpose, to put us in that setting, to put us in Greece, yeah. Yeah. Do 
So the question is about the term after pedipa. Um, and I think there are certain, we were, I was having this conversation with somebody that Nutcracker is one where we seem to have relinquished the need to say after pedipa, though he and Tchaikovsky created, and Ivanov created that structure, are all, I mean, character dances, Pedipa didn't create those character dances. They came from the countries. So, the, so what, how would you respond to? Well, also a lot of the ballets before Pedipa, or the ones that he took over and redid, for instance, he did Giselle. The version that you mainly see, even Stanton's version, is picked from Pedipa's version. And so Pedipa did a lot of redoing of other people's ballets and they usually became more popular than when he did them. Then sometimes when, like for Swan Lake was a failure and then when he did them, they became very popular. He and Lev Ivanov who did the white scenes. So um, it's, it's homage to him actually. And so the structure of a part of deux, the, the, the adage, the entree, the adage, the variations and then the coda is the way Pedipa did it. And so all his, the 19, uh, 1890s ballets that he did, uh, they all in that structure. And so... Um, and then 20th century choreographers retain that. So even yeah. things that aren't credited as after Pedipa owe a lot to... Yeah. But things like uh, Giselle and uh, uh, Don Quixote, for instance, Ramonda, is all after Pedipa. And sometimes the steps are actually pe what Pedipa did, and it might be a slightly different arm or a slightly different leg, or they might change a few little things. For instance, it would only have been a single pirouette. Now it's at least three or four, or it doesn't look contemporary anymore. So you, things have got a bit better. The leg is no not longer at 90. It has to be higher, otherwise they don't get a job. So, it's, <laughs> it's, so things have improved. Or, or at least slightly different, doesn't mean everything's better, but it has got, you know, a little bit more advanced. But usually the structure, but I've, I've actually seen um, the Bayadere, it was a, uh, um, from the Laba notation of Bayadere, which was done, um, you know, years and years and years ago, taken out of Russia, and when the, you know, with the... Um, revolution that they had and it was brought to England and it was reproduced exactly how it is and there's really not much different from it except it's a single period not a double the lifts are not as hard um, but basically the variations are all pretty much the same it's you know well I mean he was the original collaborator in the sense that he worked with the composers to get this to create the score in the structure that he wanted it and I want this kind of I want this mazurka here or this shardash here um, so even if we change things slightly, we're still indebted to that structure. The only thing that we don't usually change is people like um, Bournonville, because it's such a, a um, entity in in Denmark, and he's held in such esteem. They actually never really changed his choreography. So what you see now is what was there in 1840. It's the kind of the same stuff. Again, it might be a single period, and it used to be, and now we do a double. But things like that, it's pretty much the way it is. They don't change that too much. Great. Other questions? Yeah. How much can a choreographer add artistically and still keep the integrity of the character? That's a great question. How much can a choreographer add artistically and still keep the integrity, still call it a mazurka or a shardash? Well, if it's a mazurka <clears throat> for the... I mean, we were seeing a mazurka with the arms, but the mazurka with the legs is pretty much a mazurka. You can't... Like Ben Stevenson's version that we're going to see of Capella. I, I'd done a Peggy Van Praag's version, which was set there from the uh, English Royal Ballet's version. And it's... A mazurka's a mazurka. You don't really change it. You might change which direction they go to, but the step of a mazurka is still, is still a mazurka. The polonaise is still a polonaise. It just might be what direction they go to, they change partners. Maybe the, in, the inside is a little bit different, there's a little bit of a changeover, but basically the step will basically be the same. And the music is dictating that. Right? And the music yes. is dictating that, yeah. yeah. And it's a very difficult step for them to master. It yeah, is. Which, which you wouldn't believe until you start teaching it. They really have difficulty with the coordination of that and the rhythm. The it's that yeah, swish. The mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, as, as you guys are talking, I'm thinking that there's a way in which, not surprisingly, that character dance, like the, the, the actual step of mazurka or polonaise, is almost like a social dance in that once you know, once you have the rhythm of a cha-cha-cha, like mm -hmm. it's only a cha-cha-cha if you do the cha-cha-cha. You can mm -hmm. turn and you can 
you can embellish, but you've got to keep the rhythm of that in your legs. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I suppose it's like a tap dancer doing a time step. Like there's only so many time steps you do. So you learn the time step on there's I don't know how many there are, there's a yeah. few of them. But once you've got the basic one, if, yeah. If you don't do it with that rhythm, you're not doing the time exactly, step. Exactly, yeah. Other questions? Nobody? Yeah. So the question is about when, when we were observing the character dance class at the bar, one side of the room was using the right leg and one was using the left. Is that, tell us about that. Sure. That was done um, specifically for tonight so that you would be able to see the dancers on both sides. In any given class, um, every exercise is done with the right and with the left. So they're done on both sides. So whatever you saw tonight, they would repeat. They would turn around and repeat it on the other side, which is as we do it in a ballet class. Yeah. Because they have to be able to be with wherever the choreographer tells them to be yeah. on the stage. Yeah. Does their working in the character dance improve what they're doing in ballet? That's a great question. Does their work in character dance class improve uh, what they're doing in ballet? I see a student nodding in the back. How about you guys? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. yes. I mean, I had to teach the sleep, uh, the Swan Lake when we went to Dubai to the boys, all those character dancers. And um, if they didn't have the basics of a character class, it would take me three times longer to teach it to them because they've, if they've got the knowledge of those, like a mazurka, for instance, there's a mazurka in the Hungarian dance and stuff. So if they, if they have already that basics, then they can get the rest of it. So it helps immensely. And in fact, it's essential, I think. What about how character dance actually helps ballet technique, or does it? Mm, I, I don't think I would say it helps personally. I don't think it helps the technique. Um, I think the character that we do here, we, we base it on the classical ballet technique. We work, um, I think it helps working from the basis that you have and extending out of your basic technique to develop more style um, and line and shape for me. I think that any other type of dance can help the ballet. Um, so, you know, modern dance helps you feel more grounded or contemporary, you know, helps you move your torso differently. And with character dance, it's, it's like, um, you know, an add-on. It maybe doesn't, you could still be a successful ballet dancer without being, you know, richly schooled in character dance, but if you have that and you have the feeling of aplomb you're able to use your body in a certain way. And I think the rhythm work is, um, and the relaxation that you need in your feet to make those rhythms, I think that's, um, it's, it can only help the ballet. Um, the artist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the artist. Makes well-rounded performers too. And often when we, we are going to have a performance um, and we're choosing rep, people tend to say, well, let them just do a character dance if you know, they feel it's a group that maybe are not technically proficient to do something difficult in, in, in ballet, and that is absolutely not the way it should be done, because if you're struggling with your ballet, you're going to struggle with your character, mm -hmm. because it's a lot more complex in individual movements. So. And, and I also think it helps a young student find something inside of them that they wouldn't necessarily find. Ballet is it can be very perfectionist and um, you know, kids, kids want it just to be so perfect that they forget, oh goodness, um, that they forget about the person that they are inside and I think it gives them the opportunity to tap into something um, straight from the heart. You know, I remember being a little girl and I discovered um, the music for Don Quixote and just dancing around with a fan and I just wanted to be Kitri every day, and it, it you know it just it helps you kind of discover something within you. All right, time for one more. Uh, at what level in the uh, in the academy do the students take regular? I know they do some in the summer intensives, but when they start taking regular classes, and then how much time do they spend is that on those types of classes that they progress? In, in character specifically. So the question is about where where does character enter in the curriculum in the regular school year, and how often? So I think um, in the lower school, it's just little exercises that are um, 
included in their daily classes that they maybe don't even know are character based. And then we are a lot more serious with character classes um, from level five. And that's really the age where we feel that the, the student, they, they have enough knowledge behind them with technique and giving themselves a little more license to explore a different kind of movement and have fun because it can really be difficult when they tackle some of the rhythms and the exercises that we're giving them. So level five, they start studying character and they have one hour a week um, included in their schedule. Okay, so a special thank you to all of our guests for tonight, <laughs> especially our performers who are still backstage, so give them a really big round of applause. We are so excited to launch into the second half of our season with back-to-back -back full length ballets, all of which will give you, you now you have a little bit more um, rhythm and movement to look for, especially in the first two. So thank you for coming and braving the weather and we look forward to seeing you very soon at the theater.